of Commissioner the next summer. Uh, this uh, legislative package will include um, the revision of the ETS and possible extension to buildings and road transport, the effort sharing regulation, the revision of the of directive on and, and renewables, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, among others. Uh, but uh, so far, we are still uh, following very closely the discussion at the European Council. You'll know that October, the European Council held an orientation debate on this topic, and uh, they will meet again to to take a, a decision on the, on this target. Um, in the in the meeting of October, the European Council asked the Commission to launch some consultations with uh, with member states in order to to discuss how this um, 55 percent could affect um, uh, economic. Uh, the, the situation in, in each of the 27 uh, member states. Uh, just a very, very brief from, from my side to conclude this introductory presentation. It's clear that higher targets will need higher um, financial support. And here I want to mention that uh, the Next Generation EU, the new MFF, and the Just Transition Fund already factored in the. In, um, we believe that now member states and all the stakeholders have unprecedented support both in Green Deal but also in digital uh, transitions. And the challenge now is to ensure that this takes place as quickly as possible also in the context of the recovery. I think that we have to do very short uh, introductory remarks forward to, to discussing uh, afterwards with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Christina Borrero. Let me turn uh, now to Jakob Dalunde. I hope Jakob can hear us. Jakob, can you speak now? You have the floor. Yes, I think I think Jakob is having problems connecting. Uh, he cannot hear us apparently. Uh, we'll try and fix that and return to him, hopefully, as soon as we can get that uh, fixed. So um, I will, uh, in the meantime, jump, uh, jump straight to our next uh, speaker, who is Sophie van Eck from the Dutch Permanent Representation to the EU. Sophie, can you hear us? Yes, very well. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Frederick, and, and thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Uh, first of all, the Netherlands is very pleased with the Commission proposal to increase the European target for greenhouse gas emissions to 55% by 2030. Uh, and we also hope that there will be a swift decision making in the European Council by the end of this year. Uh, as you are aware, the Netherlands has long been advocating for increasing the targets. Uh, as we believe that early action is, is necessary to reach the objective of climate neutrality by 2050 in the most cost-effective way. Uh, in my introductory remarks, I would like to uh, focus on four areas where we think that additional action should be taken in order to reach the 55% uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030. Uh, first of all, uh, we think it is uh, of utmost importance to strengthen the current EU ETS by aligning the emission ceiling with the increased target for 2030, uh, as well as uh, uh, for a long-term objective climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, and this should lead to an increase of the, the ETS price for CO2 emissions in our uh, European industry. Uh, and of course, uh, we also need to take into account the European level playing field. Uh, secondly, um, we think that European-wide standards, uh, for instance, for CO2 emissions for vehicles and eco-design uh, standards are of utmost importance, uh, and this will help to accelerate the CO2 emission reduction in the most cost-effective way. Uh, thirdly, uh, I would like to highlight the importance to invest in new clean energy technologies, uh, such as the deployment of offshore winds, uh, uh, but we should also focus on electrification and the deployment of renewable and low carbon hydrogen. Uh, and this is particularly important uh, to decarbonize our industry and transport sectors um, where electrification is not always feasible. 
And fourth, uh, uh, the revision of the EU stated guidelines on environmental protection and energy uh, that was announced by the European Commission uh, is also very important to uh, allow for the rapid scaling up of production capacity of clean energy technologies. Uh, I want to leave it here and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, uh, Sophie. I think we're back on with Jakob Dalunde. Uh, I hope you can hear us now. Um, if so, you can now take the floor, Jakob. Thanks so much, and sorry for the technical difficulties. I, I couldn't hear a word what you were saying before, but now I, I finally do. So um, I think it, it's uh, necessary to, to, to realize that many of the uh, uh, political and legal frameworks that govern European climate policy, such as the European Emissions Trading System, the effort sharing regulation, were adopted quite recently after the Paris Agreement and were not in the even in the vicinity of being Paris compliant. Now we're discussing a climate law with a with a climate target for 2030, which is finally approaching Paris compatibility. We're discussing 55 or 60 or, or 65, and we need to be clear that 55 has no chance at all of being Paris compliant. And it's only when we are talking about 60 or 65 that we're reaching any kind of probability of meeting our Paris uh, targets. So it's good that we're finally getting close to being on track, but we have a lot of uh, ground to make up for. So the most important things are updating the uh, EU ETS and the effort sharing regulation to create the, the proper framework to make sure that both member states, uh, companies, regions, citizens, and our, our partners all around the world uh, are on track uh, towards Paris to make sure that it's, it's more profitable to invest in renewables, and uh, and the kind of uh, innovative technology that we need uh, to uh, decarbonize uh, our entire uh, economy. In the ETS, we have made some uh, some headwind in terms of the energy systems. Right now, all over Europe, many countries are dismantling their coal mines and coal power plants, and not necessarily the the greener countries in Europe, but uh, but actually countries such as Hungary and Spain, sorry, Hungary and, 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 and Poland, but also Spain uh, are now dismantling their, their coal plow, power plants and, and doing it, that, it more rapidly than they thought they would because of the ETS making it unprofitable to, to run them. But in the uh, transport sector, if you uh, take the corona uh, pandemic aside, we were still in increasing emissions from the transport sector. And we cannot solve our uh, climate issues with the pandemic. We need to do it with modal shift away from unsustainable modes of transportation, such as aviation and 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 trucks and and uh, gas-powered cars. We need to make modal shift towards more sustainable modes of transportation, such as railways and both for passengers and and freight. And we need to look into hydrogen to, to support the technological shift as well. Those are the most important things that we need to do to make sure that we can meet our Paris commitments and uh, a, a proper 2030 target. Thank you, uh, Jakob. Let me turn now to Elena Leon Munoz from Iberdrola. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Frederick. Uh, can you hear me, I suppose? So I can start. Yes, um, can. Thank you. So I'd like to start by answering the, the first question that we have in there is what will it take to get the, the 2030 objectives to, to get here, right? To me, there the answer is, is double. First of all, we need a good regulatory framework and then we need actions from our agents. So in terms of uh, the regulatory framework, I think the first thing or the, the priority we must uh, foster is to promote electrification and because of two reasons. The first is that uh, is the solution that uh, best um, complies with the energy, energy efficiency first principle that the European Commission 
already set up in their in their strategies and then because it's the only real and cost effective alternative or carbon neutral alter alternative that we already have here so the rest of the alternatives are not uh, able to be deployed in a massive way at the moment so that's to me the the, the first uh, thing we should um, uh, bet for right and I believe that the national energy and climate plans should play an essential role in the decarbonization. First of all, we should be reviewing and updating the objectives uh, to the new and more ambitious one, one that we have for 2030. And then another action, action should go into accelerating them because uh, it's not only a matter of getting to a final objective it's also the way you get to it so the sooner we move the better the emissions get reduced and uh, the more uh, likelihood we have to achieve the final objective and in terms of actions i would like to of course even draw a welcome solar ambition on, on climate targets by 2030 and in that uh, regard i would just uh, like to mention that we just presented on 75 billion euros of uh, investment plan, all of it up to 2025, and all of it devoted to decarbonization, either with uh, more renewables, more smart grids to, to connect renewables on the demand, and more customer solutions. And uh, our approach is that we need to facilitate uh, the enhancement of the consumer role, either and be very aware of their, their needs. They, they need uh, electric heating, they need uh, electric transport, or maybe green hydrogen in the industry, some other processes, etc. So we should have a broad brochure of alternatives for each demand. And we firmly believe that we're not achieving the targets, and we really think that the European funds are an excellent op opportunity to foster an efficient and cost-effective decarbonization blueprint. So in that regard, we should be very aware that uh, of the responsibility we all have in trying to take advantage and not um, benefiting from this opportunity to have uh, the most effective use of all these funds. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elena. And let me turn now to Matthias Buck for the last of the introductory statements. Matthias. Thank you. And thank you for inviting us to this event. Uh, to start with, I think it's important to stress that minus 55% emission reductions by 2030 from a technical point of view is perfectly possible. So the question is, how do we move um, the economies in Europe into that direction. In our understanding, the center of the transition um, in the power system, but also for the energy system at large, is the much more rapid scaling of renewable electricity in the system, meaning that we will um, uh, we'll be looking at a share of approximately 65% renewable electricity in the mix by 2030. How do we get there? We get there by doubling, more than doubling um, onshore wind deployment in the next decade compared to the previous decade um, by a much more um, aggressive build-up of offshore wind. It will grow by about six-fold compared to where we stand today and solar PV deployment speed should approximately triple um, during the next day, decade compared to the last decade. This is perfectly possible, but it needs to be um, enabled in different ways. So what uh, Elena Munoz already said, what is really critical is that member states are planning for this transition, particularly through the national energy and climate plans, but also through the new planning uh, processes that are now developed under um, the new EU budget framework, be it the recovery and resilience plans or the transition plans uh, from fossil to clean energy sources. So the national planning and using the opportunities that uh, come um, from the much expanded European budget in the next decade is really critical at this point in time. Perhaps I leave it here.
One point missing in the debate, perhaps at the moment, uh, that we see from our perspective is, of course, um, we will need to see a, a significant strengthening of the European emissions trading system. Higher ETS emission prices will, as, what, as was mentioned, drive a much more rapid coal phase out across the continent towards 2030. At the same time, we need to see investments in clean industry, also in hydrogen, which into technologies and processes that will become critical after 2030 to move to deeper decarbonization pathways, also in industry. Now, the challenge that we see is that this will not be enabled, those investments from industry, by the higher ETS prices that we expect in a 2030 perspective, nor from what is being discussed as a carbon border adjustment mechanism at the moment. But we will need a particular framework um, to enable European industry to invest into the clean technologies of the future. And this framework needs to be developed as well as part of uh, the big package that the Commission is preparing at the moment. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Um, and indeed, uh, we can now start the uh, uh, the debate. Um, you mentioned the need to dramatically increase uh, the share of onshore, offshore wind. Uh, we're talking about really a massive deployment of renewables uh, in the coming decade. So uh, let me uh, maybe get started um, with a, a fairly uh, basic question, which uh, maybe I will, I will put to you, um, uh, Cristina Lobillo Borrero. Uh, the European Commission in its 2050 plan assumes that just over half of the economy will be electrified by 2050. Um, but so how much electrification of the economy can be expected by 2030 and how much of that do you believe can be renewable or low carbon? Christina Borrero. Yes. Uh, thank you, Frederick, and thank you for your for your intervention of all my my colleagues here in the in the event. Well, um, the climate target plan is uh, underpinned by an impact assessment that we um, the college uh, adopted in the, in the, um, in September, and um, we we analyze different scenarios, and of course um, we assess uh, both the 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 increase of at least fifty five percent. Uh, emission reduction by 2030, but also how to reach the, the climate neutrality by 2050. And this is, allow me to, to start by saying that um, uh, increasing uh, the target by 2030 will also make easier to reach the climate neutrality. So this is one of the reasons why why need to, to we need to have a higher target in, the, in the 2030. Um, uh, of course, and uh, I think that we, we all agree that we need um, higher um, higher uh, share of electrification. Uh, we need to to um, to increase um, first the uptake of, of renewables, and and here um, according to to the uh, to the impact assessment that we um, we we have done to underpin the climate target plan, um, we will need also to increase uh, by 2030 uh, two targets. Uh, the one on the on renewables uh, policies and the second efficiency and uh, on the two of them um, I would like to mention that for for the renewables and uh, the um, says that that will carry in target uh, until uh, 38 to 40 percent by, by 2030 of renewables. While for energy efficiency, uh, we will we'll need um, to have, I mean, different target, of course, uh, when we talk about fine consumption or primary energy consumption, but uh, we we move in a, in a range of uh, 38 to, to 40, uh, 38 to 39 uh, percent of uh, energy efficiency that will have also to be to be reached by by 20, uh, 2030. So when it comes to to electrification, is of the of the, um, of the uh, we have to, to work uh, more and uh, and here uh, there are different scenarios that we we have foreseen in the assessment uh, uh, 
it's very important to highlight that when we talk about um, climate neutrality, uh, we cannot focus on one um, only. Um, uh, we need all the sectors in the economy to contribute to this very high target. So we cannot talk about energy only. Uh, Jacob mentioned before that uh, in the transport sector, particularly the road transport sector, uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions are not only uh, being reduced, but uh, increased. And, and this is, is important also to make some effort on, to, on all the, the sector. We cannot forget the, the agriculture as well, where the, the carbon sinks need to do also a significant um, effort. So, um, I, I think that it, to put things into into perspective and to and to look at all, is that all the, the the ways that we need to do the to to put into into motion just to to achieve higher targets uh, this is the reason why um we need uh, to extend the ETS, and it has been already mentioned by by uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans and the in the by our Commissioner for Energy, Gary Simpson. So we need also to to increase the target, but we need also other instruments that would also help to electrification. And here, for me, what is very important is to focus on the plan and all the 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 facility and all the possibility that we have now to finance projects in uh, increase the, the uptake of renewables and the electrification of, of some sector in particular particular the, the transport with regard to the time i think that it depends on the on the scenario that we 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 choose uh, now we are in the process to prepare individual impact assessment for each of the proposal that the college will adopt in june so we are in this in this process and uh, and uh, we will be able just to identify the the precise uptake that we need to to achieve in the Proposal. What is clear that for, for a climate and neutrality, for reaching climate neutrality, we are talking about 80% of electricity uh, coming from renewables or even higher, higher uptakes. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Christina Barrero. Um, let me um, put the same question now to, to you, Sophie Van Eck. Um, uh, I understand the Netherlands is, is doing a big effort to electrify uh, its economy. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the the priority that is given in, in your country for the electrification of transport, for example. So what kind of um, level of electrification are you currently looking at uh, in the Netherlands? Thank you very much for your question, Frederick. Um, indeed, we uh, expect major shifts in our uh, electricity mix in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, towards 2030. Uh, first of all, this is due to the phase out of our coal fired power plants uh, ultimately by 2030. Uh, and secondly, uh, we expect an ex exponential increase uh, of the share of renewable electricity uh, in our mix uh, towards 75% of total electricity production. Uh, and it is mainly due, due to the deployment of offshore winds, uh, which is for us uh, one of the major uh, sources uh, of renewable energy. Uh, and indeed, uh, increasing the rate of electrification in various end sectors is necessary to deploy this uh, 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 additional uh, renewable electricity. Uh, and we uh, indeed foresee uh, a, a large uh, increase of the use of electricity in uh, in the transport sector in our energy intensive industry. Um, it is difficult to say uh, what the uh, exact amount of electrification will be uh, uh, towards 2030 yet. Uh, we expect that our industry uh, will present a roadmap on electrification uh, by early next year. Uh, in which they um, uh, will give a further insight into the electrification uh, potential uh, within our industry. Uh, and it also provides the basis for further planning, um, for instance, uh, also regarding new infrastructure. Um, perhaps it's already good to mention now, uh, but we uh, uh, see that electricity that electrification is not the answer in all our end use sectors, uh, mainly uh, in certain uh, energy intensive uh, uh, industries in the Netherlands, 
uh, but also when it comes to uh, long distance uh, transports, uh, especially in the uh, maritime and um, uh, aviation sectors. Uh, and here we see an important uh, role of, uh, of, of hydrogen as a uh, renewable gas uh, to uh, uh, make sure that uh, also steps are taken here uh, for indirect uh, electrification. Uh, and we also think that our uh, uh, current uh, gas infrastructure uh, that can be uh, retrofitted and rebuilt, rebuilt uh, uh, for dedicated hydrogen infrastructure uh, can play an important role, uh, especially when it comes to limitations uh, that could be faced regarding the electricity grid. Uh, I want to leave it here, um, uh, but it's indeed something that we uh, will uh, further look at in the coming months. Thank you, Sophie. Um, let me turn to uh, to you, Elena Leon Munoz, about the uh, the challenge of electrification, um, moving whole sectors of the economy. With a, a big part of the car sector will have to um, uh, to, to move towards uh, electromobility. Uh, there's going to be a lot more strain put on the electricity system as a whole. How do you perceive this challenge from where you stand at Ibagolo? Thank you, Frederick. Um, as you say, uh, the, I think the first thing to do in order to promote the electrification is to um, implement a level playing field between all the energies. So at the moment, even though the renewables into the electricity are very competitive, now what we find out that the European electricity bill is full of uh, externalities and all other type of uh, taxes that uh, it puts it in a disadvantage versus another, for instance, gas or oil or whatever, right? And so um, first thing should be to, and it's not for the European funds, but we need to set that in order to give the, the correct uh, pricing now to, uh, to, the, to the customers. And then in terms of using the funds, I think uh, that uh, there's a, there's a special component of the funds, which is the, the short term, right? You know, the 70% of them should be uh, spent or committed uh, by 2022, 2023. And uh, that means that we should be uh, spending or allocating those funds in things which already have a lot of, um, let's say, impact on, on, on employment and impact on the industry in order to deliver it. So uh, one of the things we could do is to, to for instance, uh, in order to promote the electricity in the, in the light transport, uh, first we would need uh, to have some helps for the, in order to, to make this, uh, this uh, alternative more achievable for the customer. And then we should uh, develop a minimum charging, recharging network throughout the and across the Europe in order to get you know the, the minimum uh, let's say distance that we need uh, to to get comfort and to get the the feeling that we, you're not going to be uh, thrown in the highway right with the with the car with a battery that's the first thing uh, regarding heating um, again the electricity bill should uh, accomplish that and uh, there's a lot of innovation that we could do in order to reduce the volume and the and to uh, improve the technology of the heating uh, um, electric heat pumps because their energy efficiency is huge is three times the one that we can have in a traditional um, uh, a boiler but we need to reduce the their impact such as volume and um, and again the, the first uh, let's say the um, upfront the investment that the customer needs to do in order to get the, the electricity heat pump at home should be, let's say, mitigated. So that would create a lot of employment in terms of the local industry and in terms of uh, installing all these, um, this, we could say, devices. In terms of uh, the electricity sector, which is a much a massive one, I think the networks is, should be my together with the renewables, my first uh, priority in order to get so. Uh, of course, renewables, we also get a lot of um, uh, employment and industry delivery there. I don't think 
this sector, as these are already um, competitive, should have um, funds dedicated to this, devoted to this, but they should have the, let's say, the, the stability of incomes and the stability that to give uh, long-term uh, stability and, and visibility to the investments that uh, we should accomplish. And then in terms of uh, smart grids, I think the, the important thing of uh, electricity grids is that there are no regret option and they're very um, intensive in employment. Uh, we are going to need more electricity grids no matter what. Uh, maybe not that, that much uh, by 2025 than 2030, but it's for sure an overweight investment. So anything that we can do at the moment in order to improve their deployment, even for the social acceptance uh, or for funds or for the deployment, for instance, of a smart grids, uh, I mean, a smart meters, which is uh, because we're always talking about the, the enhancement of the, the consumer role. But the truth is that they, they don't have information and correct uh, price signals they won't be able to uh make the the correct uh, decisions in order to to say what to install at the level of heating or the um transport so smart meters for instance should be one of the areas in which the european funds could uh, make a good um, opportunity for the countries that they don't have them and even though the countries which do have them like spain there are other, uh, there's a new generation of smart meters that could be deployed throughout the country and to get improvements for our customers. Thank you, uh, Elena Munoz. And uh, while uh, we're with you, uh, I have a question uh, coming from the audience about uh, wholesale electricity prices. Um, Indeed, in markets like Spain, the, the, the level of, of, um, of prices in wholesale electricity markets has gone down. It's plummeted, and not just because of the pandemic, uh, but also because of the renewables, which are now so, uh, so cheap, which is a good thing in principle, but is also depressing the market. What do you think should be done in order to give a proper price signal um, in this market for wholesale electricity prices? Okay, I think there are two things, two different things here. First is the the, uh, the prices that we expect. And I would say in nominal terms, up to 20, especially for the short or medium term, 20, 25, 20, 30, we're still expecting around 45 euros per megawatt hour in the, in the electricity prices, uh, again, in nominal terms. Because even though the... the uh, there will be a cost reduction uh, for renewables. What we're expecting of the, is that a larger demand, and again, the inflation, will be able to offset in a stable and, I'd say, a broad framework, uh, the prices. Uh, what we will see, and we are already seeing, is that we have, uh, let's say, temporary um, reductions of prices derived from not only the renewables, is which at the moment, they don't have a stable class to get into the system, so it's not control. And when you have a lot of uh, large volume of renewables getting into a system, then, of course, the price is decreased. But in the long run or in the medium run, the, the, the price should be stabilized. But also what we do have is the, is the uh, let's say, the, the impact of the gas industry and the gas price. Getting into the getting into the electricity market for the wholesale. So, I, I think the stability, at least for Iberola, what comes is that we don't rely everything on the market uh, price. Okay, the wholesale is a reference, but just a reference. And what we're trying to do is to have a broader approach for the development of our renewal. So we don't only use the, the market; we also use the PPAs with uh, industrial customers. We use the, our residential customer base to hedge our prices and especially all the renewables that we are going to, to, to install. So in our view, those are the things that we need because good um, the, the, the reduction of prices will be always an advantage for our sector and for our customers. So we cannot fight against that. 
what we need to find is uh, wiser ways to get to the customers and to hedge our base load uh, energy, which is of course very impacted by the by the prices. But the but there's a way of hedging them even with forward markets or again with using our customer base. Thank you, Elena Munoz. Uh, Matthias Berg, I saw that you were re reacting when uh, we started this discussion about wholesale electricity prices. Is, do you have maybe views to share on that, on how uh, the European Union and maybe some regulatory measures could be adopted at the EU level to, to give a, a, a price signal on the electricity market to, in order to stimulate this? I think at this point, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not looking for <laughs> new instruments um, for electricity markets, but actually what we need to see in the next few years is the full and effective implementation of what has been adopted in the last legislative package. Why? Because it will help to um, free up the <laughs> electricity price. Many of the measures in uh, the package um, are directed at enhancing the flexibility of the power system on both the uh, generation and the demand side. And this is actually what we need to see to um, bring all the uh, renewable electricity that is generated into the market and as well to have um, consumers benefit as much as possible from um, more flexible um, wholesale power markets. Now, at the same time, where we see there is a real need, and it has been mentioned before by previous speakers, is that um, the price signal that arrives at the end consumer is not the wholesale uh, price market uh, signal, but it is um, a, a very diffuse, uh, diffuse market signal with a lot of taxes, charges, and levies put on top of it. It's uh, not a special situation in Germany, but across most of Europe. And one of the main um, re needs for reform in order to um, speed up electricity-led decarbonization of the entire energy system is to um, take off some of these uh, charges and levies on the end consumer electricity price and rather shift them to the fossil fuel use um, in other sectors. And this is essentially a domestic agenda in the member states. Of course, there can be some support um, through energy taxation directive if there is a consensus in the council on it, um, or possibly as well a, a, an additional push through an expanded EU emissions trading system. But in a nutshell, um, we are quite um, happy that in, in effective and full implementation of what we have on the books on power market functioning at the moment would really advance uh, the electricity-led energy transition in Europe. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, maybe uh, let me ask you, uh, Christina uh, Borrero, about the uh, the state of uh, the uh, the electricity market currently. Is that a, a reason for concern at the European Commission? And you're looking at those uh, wholesale electricity prices. With um, um, you know, are you worried by that? Um, and is the Commission maybe planning to? Uh, do something additional in order to, to try and stimulate uh, this market? Yes, thank you. Indeed, well, I, I fully share what had been said on it. Uh, I think that there is one important factor uh, that um, had strong influence on the on the price of the, of the electricity. It's also the, the internal market, the internal market that the um, uh, perfectly functioning. Eh? So this is one of the of the purpose of the goal that the the, the European Commission proposed directive and and the regulation on the, on the internal electricity market. And uh, and we believe that um, as Matthias has just mentioned, we have a package. Uh, of legislative proposal that were adopted very recently, a few years ago, and now um, they are into force and we need to see the effect. So for me, uh, this is one of the of the elements that this, uh, is very important for, for the Commission. We are very, very closely following the functioning of the of the internal market. We need to ensure that the 
flows uh, among the different uh, member, member states. Uh, but there is another another element that I think is also important, and we are we are also in the Commission um, watching uh, very very closely. And it's also it has been mentioned is um, uh, the prices of um, of uh, renewables technologies uh, one more than other have. So, I I wanted to to give you um, one um, the information you you may have um, in a report the, uh, released by the International Energy Agency. Um, it says that uh, renewable uh, power is growing robustly um, this uh, in the world this year, uh, with a strong contrast with the sharp declines um, uh, triggered by the COVID-19 crisis in many other uh, parts of the energy sector, such as oil, gas, and, and coal. Huh? So I think that this is also um, very, uh, very important because we'll have an influence in the rest of the, of the electricity. As far as we we manage to have a higher deployment of renewables, um, this will also have an influence in the in the, in the final uh, price for for consumers as well. So from the Commission side, uh, very just to sum up, we are watching very very closely the functioning of the market uh, and uh, and also um, we are also uh, very closely following how the the new technology is. Uh, um, Cheaper uh, in the in the next uh, in the years to to come, so we don't. Uh, as you know, uh, we the Commission working program has been recently adopted, and we we foresee uh, the review of the two directive on energy efficiency and and renewables. Uh, but we don't uh, foresee uh, because we have a legislation in force for the um, functioning of the electricity internal market. Thank you. Right, so no further reforms of the electricity market uh, as part of the uh, upcoming package. Um, but you did uh, mention the energy taxation directive um, uh, earlier, and uh, indeed here there could be some tweaks in order to further stimulate the, uh, the shift towards electrification, right? Can you maybe expand a little bit on that, so Christina Barrero? Yes, well, I, I cannot because this is this proposal is under under preparation and uh, uh, is I work in the DNR and uh, my colleagues from TAC are preparing the proposal of course in close cooperation with with the DNR. Uh, indeed the energy uh, directive um, the energy taxation directive is one of the of the piece of legislation that will be part of the summer package in the, in the next year um, and uh, well uh, what I can say now is that uh, this uh, review needs to be very much aligned with the green deal political objectives uh, so has to be so uh, we are now considering different uh, options, but and at this moment is under very, uh, let's say, preliminary preparation. So we'll have the occasion to launch the public consultation and, and the impact assessment to gather all the, all the comments from the stakeholders. But I can assure that this will be the main purpose, to align the, the review with the Green Deal political objectives and uh, incentives. Um, uh, that will be pa will be part of the June 20 package. I cannot reveal more information on this stage because again it's under internal uh, consideration. I understand. Uh, I, I tried my luck at least. Uh, thank you, Christina Barrero, for for your answers. Um, coming back to uh, the, the 2030 target plan um, and um, renewables. Um, so we saw that the European Commission now thinks of raising the share of uh, renewables in, in the EU's energy mix um, up to 40%, uh, which is about twice what we have currently uh, in, in the energy system. So we, we're talking about doubling the share of, of, of renewables uh, in just a decade. Uh, now, what kind of measures do you think will actually be needed to reach that goal? Maybe Jakob Dalunde, um, you could say a, a few words about that. Yes, um, thank you. Um, and I would first like to say that um, in the previous mandate, when we made the uh, 
the latest revision of the ETS. Um, we did not go as far as many in the environmental movement would have wanted to. And the main reason for that was the manufacturing side. In my opinion, we left a lot of mitigative potential on the table when it comes to the energy sector. But because of the risk of uh, undermining uh, competitiveness of the in industrial sector, we made slower progress on, on increasing the ambition on the ETS than we could have made. So I think that we should look into um, not necessarily separating the in uh, manufacturing sector from the uh, energy sector, but maybe looking into um, a price floor for the energy sector to make sure that we have a minimum price of uh, that would be rising that could begin right now with with maybe 30 euros and then um, increase that price floor uh, similar to that uh, to the ETS systems in in both uh, California and in in, in Canada. Uh, I think there's a great potential to uh, move much more rapidly in the energy sector to make sure that we don't only have a target of of, uh, of doubling the uh, renewables from a polit perspective, political perspective, but actually making it much more profitable for companies to do it on their own, regardless of political targets, that would be much more effective. I believe much more in market mechanisms than political uh, targets, but we won't do so until uh, we make sure that uh, we can handle the competitiveness of the manufacturing sector. So either a price floor for the energy sector or that we move much more quickly in, in introducing a carbon a border mechanism to protect the uh, manufacturing sector and, and make sure that we create a level playing field of European manufacturing and and manufacturing sector in the in the rest of the world. Those two are the most important things, in my opinion. Thanks, Jakub. Uh, Matthias Berg, maybe a few reflections uh, there. Um, reacting to uh, what Jakub Dalunde has said, he suggested some kind of price floor uh, on the ETS for the energy sector. Uh, does that sound like a, a good idea to you? And, and maybe you have other views, other ideas about um, how the EU could effectively double the share of, of renewables in just one decade. I mean, this is enormous as a challenge, right? Uh, but it is doable. <clears throat> I think this is important to, to stress, yeah. Um, now on the ETS reform, I think there there is a lot of um, there are a lot of issues for reflection on what the Commission put into its September communication. Um, so something the European Parliament uh, didn't fully discuss in the last ETS reform: how do we deal with the situation where we have a significant, a significantly higher cap than real world emissions under the ETS? So what we in the technical speak are calling the rebasing of the emissions trading system as one important step to bring the cap down to the real emission needs in the sectors currently covered under the ETS. This could already go a very long way in um, taking some volatility out of the um, price signal in the emissions trading system. Um, then, of course, um, moving to a higher uh, contribution of the emissions trading system to an enhanced uh, European target um, would also increase the robustness of the um, uh, price signal under the emissions trading system. There are different um, expectations where we would be in 2030. Um, we assume we would probably see a price around uh, 55 euros uh, per ton of CO2 emissions. Um, that's probably a conservative estimate, and this would um, help to um, have a much more accelerated phasing out of coal. But I think this is very important uh, for us in, in when we're looking at the bigger picture. This would not yet enable European industry in making the investments that are necessary to move to greening um, industrial processes. If uh, you look at the industrial investment, so, so the, 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 let's say the investment environment, they would need to have a price signal in the ETS of between 100 
270 euros per ton of CO2 emissions in order to uh, invest into, for instance, uh, green steel technologies. Now, this is not realistic, um, a price to expect from the ETS in the short term because of all the competitiveness concerns around industry. So what we need in addition to a strengthening of the ETS is indeed a self-standing or let's say a complementary framework for to enable industry to invest into the green, clean technologies that will be necessary in order to reach um, greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. So this is something where the Commission needs to add on in our view to its work program uh, to really help industry see its place in a carbon neutral uh, European setting. Currently, this is very difficult from an industrial perspective to see if you're working in the cement, steel or chemicals sectors. Now, uh, the scaling for renewables, I think there are still a number of unused options. I mean, the Commission is now pushing rightly for a much more rapidly um, increasing offshore wind. Um, we need much more cooperation of the member states in the respective regions, be it the Baltic or the North Sea regions, to um, cooperate in scaling offshore wind. There is a lot that can be done to more rapidly scale solar PV in Europe, for instance, um, by making it mandatory for all new houses um, to put solar uh, PV on top, to use um, the large rooftops that we have in supermarkets, etc., also for much more rapid scaling of solar. So there's a lot that can happen. Um, or an interesting example uh, developed by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission that you could convert former coal mining regions to energy producing regions by essentially uh, deploying large scale um, solar PV in many of those uh, regions that uh, from a radiation perspective uh, would be really possible. So there are many opportunities that we have, but we need to use them. And in order to use them, the member states in particular need to do their homework. So and update, as uh, Elena mentioned, the NECPs, the National Energy and Climate Plans, and identify the opportunities um, they have in order to accelerate renewables deployment. Thank you, Matthias. Um, Sophie Van Eck, maybe um, a, a reflection about um, the need to double uh, the share of renewables um, in the energy mix for the coming decade. This is more or less what the European Commission has in mind uh, when it tabled it, uh, its 2030 uh, climate target plan. Does that more or less fit with what uh, the Netherlands have got uh, planned uh, for, for your own country? Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, the uh, deployment of offshore renewable uh, energy will be of crucial importance to us in the coming years. Uh, and here uh, we see an exponential increase uh, in, in the coming years happening. Uh, and indeed, um, um, it is important uh, to, to strengthen uh, the EU ETS to, to further uh, uh, stimulate this. Uh, and I can echo what the previous speakers have said. Uh, specifically, what we would like to see uh, in the revision of the EU ETS uh, is a substantial increase uh, of the linear reduction factor uh, uh, in the scheme. Uh, and we also find it important to enhance the market stability reserve uh, to fully cope with surplus allowances. Uh, when it comes to the role of, of industry in boosting the demand for, for electricity, uh, we, we think it is very important to uh, do joint planning uh, also together with, with industrial clusters uh, to uh, be aware of what is possible uh, to uh, meet their uh, CO2 reduction targets for 2030. Uh, which in the Netherlands we have enshrined uh, as part of our national climate agreements. Uh, and we think that um, uh, also planning in terms of, of hydrogen uh, production capacity or electrolysis capacity can help uh, to improve the business case for uh, offshore winds uh, in, in, in this respect. Uh, uh, also, when uh, that electrolysis capacity is planned uh, nearby uh, industrial clusters. Uh, so we think that that's a very important element to look at as well on the member state level. 
uh, and that is an exercise that we have already started and also expect to uh, further develop uh, in, in the coming year together with our industrial partners. Um, sorry, I'm just muting myself. Uh, Sophie, let me um, uh, let me ask uh, to you the next uh, question, staying with you on energy efficiency, which is one of the key objectives that the EU has consistently failed uh, to meet uh, in the past year. Um, do, do you think something more radical now needs to be done about energy efficiency as we look forward to uh, decarbonizing the economy uh, substantially in the next? A decade. Do you, do you believe something like mandatory targets, for example, should now be put on the table at the European level? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, for the Netherlands, uh, uh, there is one key objective for 2030 and 2050, uh, and that is CO2 reduction. Uh, so that is also uh, the, 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 the primary target or the leading target for us. Uh, that needs to be realized uh, in the most cost-effective way um, and that is important for us to maintain uh, the, 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 uh, the public support uh, for, for the energy transition uh, to make sure that we reach the long-term objectives uh, most efficiently. Uh, when it comes to energy efficiency, indeed there is uh, still a lot of potential, uh, especially uh, as one of the uh, uh, options uh, to realize CO2 reduction. Uh, so where uh, this is the cheapest uh, possibility to reduce your emissions, uh, it also needs to happen. Uh, at the same time, uh, when, when you look at um, uh, the measures that need to be taken from an energy system perspective, um, uh, we also uh, uh, think that it's important uh, to realize that uh, uh, certain uh, um, uh, technologies are needed um, and that, um, uh, re that, 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 that um, are important for, for realize, uh, realizing CO2 reduction, uh, but that uh, from a strict energy efficiency perspective uh, may not be the best way forward. So, so, to answer your question, uh, we think indeed it is important to, to focus on where the most cost effective potential is still um, ahead of us in terms of CO2 reduction. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also what the discussion should be focusing on in the coming, um, well, in, 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 in preparing the fit for 55% uh, package uh, that we published this year. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, let me ask um, uh, Jakob Dalunde uh, the, the same question. Uh, we've, we've consistently failed to meet the energy efficiency targets uh, over the past years. So do you think something now radically different needs to be made uh, as we look forward uh, to, to the 2030 uh, objectives? Yes, uh, I, I think it's important to, to, to consider that only using regulation and targets to, to ask for more energy efficiency is not necessarily the best way to do it. It's much better to create economic incentives for um, stakeholders to do it um, themselves and use uh, raised revenues through those economic incentives to support new technology, uh, and pilot projects on, on energy, energy efficiency that could be supported uh, through different uh, EU support mechanisms. For example, Horizon Europe could be used to uh, support new technologies and adaptation of such new technologies for much higher um, energy efficiency. But, uh, but most important is, is supporting uh, uh, um, a market framework where energy efficiency is the logical solutions for uh, both owners of, of buildings uh, and inhabitants uh, of them and and companies that's the best way forward and from a swedish point of view we have had such policy for a very long time so uh, buildings in 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 sweden and, and other countries in northern europe are are quite efficient but when we look at um 
buildings in other parts of Europe, especially southern Europe. They are bleeding um, energy, which is uh, quite a big waste. And I, I fully realize that having a, um, a uniform solution for entire Europe, it, it's quite difficult and it would be very disadvantageous to southern Europe. And 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 doing it in in, in such a uniform way, which create uh, would create uh, energy poverty and and create quite a burden on many citizens in southern Europe. So I think this is a very good example of where we could use the uh, the regional funds, the social funds, funds that are meant to uh, support a more um, equal Europe using those funds in a way that creates both a more equal Europe and a more sustainable Europe at the same time uh, would be a good way to tackle this issue. Jakob Dalunda, I understand you're the rapporteur in the European Parliament uh, on the Commission's proposal for um, uh, integrated energy um, uh, systems. Is there, in the preparations that you're making for your report, uh, anything in particular that you foresee um, or, or proposals that you've seen coming from the European Commission that, that you think will be instrumental to increase energy savings in the coming decade? In, in the discussions that we have had uh, among the uh, political stakeholders in this process, um, I sense that there is a greater appetite for uh, instruments that support energy efficiency much more than we've had before, and that's very um, encouraging. So I hope that this new strategy will, will be a paradigm shift in the, in the way that we discuss energy efficiency, at least politically. This is only a strategy, it will have no legal implications uh, in the short term, but I, I hope it, it will send a, a signal that it will be very inefficient to only talk about expansion of renewables if we don't uh, also tackle energy efficiency. Because we have to realize in the, in the very urgent situation that we are right now in terms of, of climate change, even expanding renewables has an environmental impact. We cannot only solve this issue by expanding renewables. We also have to uh, come to terms in the way that we're using energy is also inefficient, especially when it comes to uh, buildings, but also when it comes to the transport sector. Uh, only talking about electrification of, of transport is, is not enough, since it's very inefficient to transmit ele energy between rubber tires and asphalt roads. We lose a lot of energy in that transmission and it's much more efficient to um, move vehicles forward when it's steel towards uh, railway tracks, for example. So we don't only need modal shift, so we don't only need technological improvements when it comes to energy efficiency in the transport sector, we also need a modal shift to, towards transport modes that are inherently efficient and away from transport modes that are inherently inefficient, such as road transport with rubber to asphalt. Thank you, Jakob de Lunde. Uh, Elena Munoz, I saw you were uh, reacting about what Jakob was just saying. Do you think something radically different now needs to be done about um, energy efficiency uh, at the European level? And do you believe this sector integration strategy that the Commission presented earlier this year could provide maybe part of the answer to this? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with what um, with uh, Jakob. I uh, mean, it's not only a technological improvement, it's also a way and a habit that we all have uh, for using the energy that we do. And uh, uh, coming into the buildings, of course, and he mentioned the south of um, the southern countries of Europe. Uh, I totally agree with them. It's just a unique solution for all the countries that wouldn't work. And we also need to run cost-benefit uh, cost analysis for that part because, of course, we know have an impact, but um, we need to be realistic in terms of uh, energy improvement. So it's easy to change boiler and to get into a, an electric heat pump, for instance. That's a good thing. It's easy to change windows for um, to, to gain efficiency there. 
but it's not that easy to think about isolating houses. Um, they are very; those actions are very, and those measures are very invasive into the customer, and they're not so. They they're not willing to do so. So it wouldn't be realistic to think that we are going to achieve a lot of um, improvement in energy efficiency doing, let's say, construction and main construction changes. Uh, that's something that I think is very, very expensive and it should be analyzed uh, versus the, okay, I could either do that in a massive way, the construction works, or I could uh, have an additional part of renewables in order to electrify that part of the of the consumption. And I'm pretty sure that especially for the South, uh, or Spain, I would say, Italy, Portugal, the South, France, the, the Southern countries, that economics uh, is better for electrification. And again, to be realistic is very important because the construction is not always working. It generates, apparently generates a lot of employment, but at the end of the day, people are not willing to accomplish those measures at home because it has a lot of work in, inside their houses. In terms of transport, the same. The railway, of course, should be changed. And uh, I also think um, that uh, at the moment we are, at 2020, we are trying to think, and when you were talking about uh, what part of the electrification will be you know, part of the, of the cake, Figures we, we can run into uh, figures were, but the truth is that the only only the reality will come out along the years, and we need to so we could let's say battle for 60, 70, 80 percent. I don't know. I think at the moment it's pretty sure which type of consumption can be electrified, and again to that would mean to to gain a lot of energy efficiency. And there are some niche areas that at the moment we think they're not uh, feasible or at least not competitive to be electrified. But uh, every time I start reading some reports and some investigations some research, I'm more, I'm more sure and more positive than uh, not all the things that we are thinking now that won't be able to be electrified will be. Uh, for instance, the, 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 the heavy duty transport I'm more optimistic now than I was some months before about their electrification. So one of the things is that everything to be done regarding energy efficiency is okay. Anything, anything regarding um, no regret options is okay. But again, don't uh, we shouldn't make a lot of decisions based on technologies approach that still have to come because we are 2020, uh, the technology progress is in a way that it always surprises us, uh, even for the cost of the reduction cost of renewables, is something that they, they're still decreasing that they will be. And the same for electrification and all the end uses. And in the, regarding your last, quest, last questions about the integration uh, strategy, the sector integration strategy of the uh, European Commission, I think we really welcomed the strategy. It was a very, very long uh, strategy. We were willing to, to get that, and I think it uh, sets the, the good principles that should be accomplished. However, I just want to highlight some things regarding the hydrogen. The hydrogen, we all welcome the green hydrogen as part of the uh, promising uh, solutions that will make us or enable us to achieve uh, the total decarbonization by 2050. But we still have to even though we're optimistic um, from Iberdrola, we are betting on the on the technology and um, the, the end uses of it. We think that we shouldn't be losing our view about what the green hydrogen is. It's a very, very expensive solution at the moment. It's not uh, effect, uh, efficient at all. So just bear in mind that one terawatt hour of uh, renewables uh, or is needed to get just 70 percent of so 0 0.7 terawatts hour of hydrogen so it's a very uh, expensive and non-efficient solution so it should be preserved to those consumptions in which there is no other alternative and where there is more valuable the most value can get from the green hydrogen so 
it's good to talk about the green hydrogen. It's something that uh, our company is betting on and going to, to progress on. But uh, let me back up to my first thing is that, of course, it's good, but let's start by electrification, which is what we already have here. And when it comes to hydrogen, I think we're talking more about words and ideas rather than uh, a potential and imminent deployment of the technology. Thank you, uh, uh, Elena Munoz. And uh, indeed, we, we could have a whole conference just on the subject of, of hydrogen, but uh, this is increasingly something I hear from, from all sides is that the, uh, the amounts of, of the green sort of hydrogen are so small and not projecting to, to increase uh, so much in the, in the coming years that they should in be, indeed probably be reserved for those areas of the economy uh, which can't really do uh, anything else but, but switch to that and have no um, possibility for electrification at the moment. Um, I think uh, we're um, unfortunately reaching uh, the end of this conference, but I will quickly uh, ask each one of you in turn to maybe summarize in a very few words what you would like our watchers uh, to take away uh, with them uh, because we're being followed uh, right now on, on YouTube um, by, um, by people following us uh, there. So maybe just in a few short sentences, uh, you could summarize what you would want them to take home as the main message. And Matthias, but maybe we can start with you. Um, Matthias, you should unmute yourself. Thank you. So my, mes my main message is achieving a higher climate target in Europe is perfectly possible. At the center of increasing our climate ambition is a much more rapid build up of renewable electricity generation capacity in Europe. And in order for this to happen, we need governments across the continent to do the homework to put in place the regulatory frameworks and also the financing conditions to have this scaling of renewables happen at the speed it needs to happen and as cheap um, as possible. And it can be very, very cost effective nowadays. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Elena Leon Munoz, maybe a few concluding words from your side? Yes, um, we need two things. Again, a good, a very good regulatory framework, um, trying to preserve the principles we've said, like energy efficiency first, no harm, no regret, and trying to preserve that there's no need for just one unique solution for everything. And that framework should give enough visibility for the agents to uh, take actions on decarbonization. And uh, again, let me highlight and conclude with the bet of our, our company of Iberdrola, what we are going to do up to 2025. We're going to invest 75 billion euros in decarbonization, all of them. And we, are going to, we have committed to uh, achieve carbon neutral in Europe by 2030, which uh, I think is the only way of getting the final picture is if every agent and every action delivers in a final goal and target that can be more concrete and not only works. So actions need a good framework, but also need commitment for the companies. Thank you, Elena Munoz. And uh, Sophie Van Eck, a few concluding words from your side. So, it is crucial to uh, increase the target to 55% uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and uh, it is also important to put the right framework in place, uh, both on the European and the national level. So, strengthening the current EU ETS. Uh, installing e European wide standards uh, for eco design and uh, the transport, um, investing in new clean energy technologies, and also allowing member states to do so uh, for a revision of the EU uh, state aid guidelines. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Jakob Dalunde, uh, the main message you'd like our audience to take away home, what would that be? 
I'm quite certain that uh, reaching our 2030 targets will be easier than we are thinking right now. I'm confident that in 10 years, we will wonder and question why we were not more ambitious and put the work to, to, handle, to handle by future uh, generations. I think that more, the, the difficult thing is the social perspective, um, making sure that even though the green transition will create economic opportunities and new growth, it will not be um, evenly um, affected in, in the population. So we need to make sure that we have mechanisms in place to make sure that everybody can, can, can uh, flourish in the green transition. That will be the difficult part. Thanks, Jakob. And so, uh, Christina Barrero, you have the privilege of closing the conference with a few points that you would like our audience to take home with them. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick, and thank you to everyone. I think that I, I would like to, to conclude with very short messages. The first one is that uh, we, we are meeting now uh, in a situation where we are still struggling with a pandemic uh, that only um, some months ago uh, would have been unthinkable. Um, we have now is just to overcome this situation and find solution as soon as possible. But we cannot lose sight uh, on the climate change crisis, that this crisis will not go um, away. So we need uh, to, uh, to, to prepare uh, the next generation. And, uh, and this is the reason why young union we need to increase our our ambition um we have our studies uh have proven that uh this is not only uh possible i mean it's doable but it's also beneficial for for the whole society because uh, our green deal is it's not only uh, a strategy to fight against uh, climate change, but it's also a strategy that will create uh, growth, will create uh, jobs, and of course, uh, prepare better planet for the future generations. Um, as it has uh, been said, uh, we need, I think, two main things. We need the so we need a, a solid sound uh, legislative framework and we also need a financial instrument to, to make it happen. Uh, and for this, I think now uh, more than ever, incredible opportunity with the re recovery and resilience facility. And I think that the next uh, three years will be um, crucial for, um, for helping for, for contribute to your ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Thanks to all the speakers for joining us today. Thanks to all of those who followed us uh, on YouTube for this virtual conference. We have many more planned uh, in the coming weeks uh, at your active, more discussions on energy, the energy transition. Uh, as you know, the discussions are now intensifying uh, to get the 2030 targets adopted. So we have much more uh, planned for you on your active to just check our website, events.youractive.com. Um, thanks to Iberdrola for supporting this conference. And uh, well, stay tuned and bye for now. <laughs>